this music is very scary. Um, I thought that rather than just me talking and, and you keeping quiet, um, we, I'd be very happy to have a bit more of an interchange in terms of what I'm saying. And if you don't agree with me, I'd be very happy to hear why. Um, but just as a show of hands so that I know who's here, could you perhaps just raise your hands if you're a developer? Are, you, are any developers here? Could you give me a show of hands? Right. Uh, so that's a, almost a majority. What about property agents? Um, yeah. Professionals uh, building real estate? Uh, yeah. Great. Okay. So we have a preponderance of developers. And we, I have a little bit of commonality because for 20 of those 35 years, I was a developer too. Um, what I'm going to try and do today is really to talk about an overview. I think Tom has covered this in, in, in much greater depth and, and, and very eruditely. Um, but what I'm going to try to do is to go back into where I see the origins uh, and the economic logic behind the Belt and Road. Um, and then looking at what's behind, which I call the mega trends, how does that impact real estate? And hopefully we could have a little bit of a dialogue in terms of whether you think I'm looking at this the right way. And finally, give you some conclusions, uh, perhaps some of the points that Tom actually raised as he went through his speech. But I think I'll try and focus a little bit more on the real estate aspects of, of what he said. So an overview. The Silk Road is a very romantic reference to it. Tom has talked a little bit about the Silk Road, but I think the key thing to, to note here is that it's really, China tries to project this as a mutual growth and trade and innovation through connectivity in, and infrastructure development. That's how it was quoted uh, in 2012. But I would like to go a little bit further back in terms of the origin, not 2012, when Xi Jinping became the chairman, but more to the time when he became secretary of, of the Communist Party. And my feeling is that China was very badly affected by the financial crisis of 2008, and it realized its vulnerability, particularly with relationship to the US. Um, and you know, since then, China has never returned to the same growth rates that it enjoyed before. Um, and as Tom has mentioned, the TPP that Obama tried to espouse actually was a means by which China was being told, basically, look, you don't belong to the first tier. We do, and we will run the show. Um, and I think the response took three to four years for China to sort of actually put together its response. And in doing so, I think this is a very fundamental shift of the entire economic model of China. And its size demands that it reevaluates its world role. Hence, you know, China taking on the championship of, of, of various international initiatives. And as again, as Tom said, it's benefited greatly from the from free trade, and therefore, obviously, would 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 want to, um, you know, champion that. But I think coming back to how important this is is that the supervision of the National Development and Reform Commission, which is really at the top end uh, of Chinese governance, is supervising this. So you can see that this is a very, very serious move. Um, so coming back, I think there are two perspectives to be taken on One Belt, One Road. And I think also the shift from calling it One Belt, One Road to the Belt and Road Initiative was actually to make it less um, frightening. Uh, when you say one belt, one road, there's only one guy who runs it, right? Whereas if it's just an initiative, everybody has a part to play in it. Um, and I think as was also mentioned, I think China sees that it's always seen itself as a middle kingdom and really looking out, um, China is really securing its borders, whether it's the South China Sea or around the landmass around the other side of China, um, you know, Kazakhstan and, 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 and Russia. And infrastructure enables China. See, one of the things that we have understood is that since 2012, the overcapacity that China has built, today, for example, 
50% of the world's overcapacity in steel is Chinese. Something like three million people are involved in the infrastructure companies and they don't have enough work to do. So the one belt and road from an economic point of, uh, of view um, is exporting Chinese labor and exporting Chinese capability at somebody else's cost. That's the first thing I think that one needs to think about. The second is that the ports are really a means of securing China's energy and raw material supply. And I'll go into that in a little bit. This is why I'm not going to focus too much on the ports and rail, um, i.e. the goods rails, because frankly, I don't see that much value from our point of view from a real estate perspective. And the other thing I think which is not fully appreciated is China's intention to rewrite technical standards. Uh, you know, we don't even think about it, but most of our technical standards are either US or British based. And they control, I mean, if you look at, say, Singapore or Malaysia, our standards for fire safety, example, are British standards. Now, if China rewrites those standards by Chinese means, they then control the narrative on how countries work from behind the scenes. So there is an underlying perspective from my point of view which affects us in real estate. And one of the key ones is look at the railroad. That gauge is a Chinese gauge. That means nobody else in the world is going to be able to service that railroad once it's built. So we need to think in terms of strategy when you look at Chinese in investment. Now, let's start looking at the renaissance in infrastructure. Why is it happening? The first thing that we need to understand, I think, is that global supply chains have become the norm. We keep talking about supply chains, but essentially it's from raw material all the way through to manufactured goods and then the sale to end markets. And today, an aircraft, an Airbus, for example, is made in 22 countries and it's assembled. China is the world's greatest assembler of finished goods. So all these connections come back to China today. The second thing is that we are seeing probably the greatest global migration in the history of the world. If you look at this, we have 2.2 billion urban dwellers just 10 years ago. By 2050, it will have more than doubled. And just in the next 14 years, or 13 years, 410 million people are going to move into cities. And underlying this sort of physical infrastructure is the telecommunication and internet infrastructure. What this does is that infrastructure now becomes more important than territorial control. And in a sense, I think what we're seeing is America playing the old game. I think um, President Trump will be in Vietnam, and one of the things he is going to be doing, which has not been publicized, is inaugurating another naval base. Old game, waste of money doesn't produce anything. So China is way ahead. And not being perceived as a threat is what the Chinese are very conscious about. So when you say, look, you need infrastructure, I'm going to build it, I'm going to finance it, I'm going to help you with it, how do you say no to that? So you become the friendly partner as opposed to the Americans who are saying, I'll build you another naval base and I'll put in a few more soldiers. Very smart. And there is one more mega trend, which again Tom alluded to, and that is the growth of Chinese engagement with the world. And I'll go into that a little bit more because that is where some tremendous opportunities lie ahead. Now let's start looking at some of the major initiatives. ASEAN's perspective of itself is to have a regional connectivity 
through its ports and its roads. China has added the element of the high-speed rail. So each of these areas actually predate the Chinese. It's, it's not the Chinese that thought of it. But what they've been very clever at is actually linking onto ASEAN's own ambitions. And if I look at some of the projects, by no means all, um, you can see that they're basically divided between rail and ports. Um, and they have different purposes. And we will get into that in a little bit more detail later. So if I look then at the mega trends and I say, how do we divide these projects? I would look at the port projects, transportation hubs and industrial projects as supply chain. I then look at urban growth and connectivity projects into offices, townships, residential, etc. And then I look at tourism and technology together, and I'll explain why in a minute. Supply chains. Well, I think all of us in this room know what a supply chain is, but the reason I put this up is because this actually gives you the kind of real estate that goes behind the supply chain. And what is interesting to note is that if you look at road and rail, special economic zone or free trade zones and office parks and port terminals, warehouses and logistics, when China comes in under the Belt and Road Initiative, there really is no place for local property players. I'll give you one example, and I know that we have people here from Myanmar, but if you look at what China is doing with this, uh, with, the, with the oil platform and the, and the gas platform, essentially it is feeding Kunming. Um, in fact, if you were to go to Kunming, according to Parakana, a friend of mine, taxi drivers don't even know that there's a three million barrel refinery in Kunming, because they're not being told where it is, but it's there. Um, and the objective is to use Myanmarese gas and oil and refine it in China. Now, what's interesting here is that China controls both the extraction part, the transportation part, and the end use. But the loan has been taken by Myanmar. And how are they going to pay that back? By having a toll fee on these pipelines and gas lines. Now, if I control the supply and the demand, and I decide I'm not going to use it, next round, I buy the pipeline for nothing, which is what has happened in Sri Lanka with the port. It was built by the Chinese. 34,000 ships pass by Sri Lanka. 340 ships a year go to Hambantota port until the Chinese took it over. And when they took it over, they took over the fact that there are going to be no special economic zones. They're going to export their factories out of China into that special economic zone. And the locals are not going to play any part of that game. So we need to understand that these are very strategic moves. So it's a consistent storyline in Laos. It's a consistent storyline story in Malaysia. So by becoming an investor, an asset owner, a supply chain operator in another country, China gets preferential market access and becomes part of that strategic decision-making process of how resources will be managed. Now, I'm not saying that China is predatory, but because countries have difficulty in negotiating or do not understand how to negotiate, I mean, you're dealing with, when you're a monkey dealing with a gorilla, you know who wins the fight. So it's a very difficult um, negotiation, and most countries can't can't handle it. Now, let's look at a more positive aspect of this initiative, and that is the urban growth and connectivity. I talked a little bit a time ago about the growth of cities. Five of the fastest growing cities in the world are going to be Southeast Asia. Manila, Hanoi, and Ho Chi Minh City are going to grow between 6 and 8% per annum for the next 20 years. That is huge. Kuala Lumpur, greater Kuala Lumpur, and Jakarta are going to grow at a, at a lower rate. 
But that means that by 2050, Jakarta will be the 11th most valuable city in the world on a par with Europe and America. But what happens when a city grows? You end up with tremendous degradation because of traffic jams, people who need to be moved, goods that need to be moved, and the cities can't cope because these are old cities, the roads are very small, so infrastructure becomes critical. And this is where the Chinese have stepped in to say, look, we're going to help you to leapfrog. And what does that result in in terms of real estate? We have offices, industrial, tourism and retail, and residential. So Obor's impact is actually complex and requires a strategic perspective. Today, most developers base their decision on real estate property agents reports uh, and then have a gut feeling and then go ahead and build. And one of the things that I've found in the work that I've done since I've given up being a developer and being more on the consulting side is that local data is very deficient. Even in Malaysia, um, Singapore is probably the most up-to-date, but as I say, it's often information, but it's not knowledge. Indonesia is very, very difficult. Uh, so again, you end up with incomplete information, and the data lag between ideas to develop and the end construction means that you end up with boom and bust cycles, because you you know, by the time you decide and you build, it's four years down the road or five years down the road, and then suddenly everybody's built at the same time. So getting around that, they, we need to think about real estate from another perspective. Um, it's much more volatile today. Um, and what we've found is that when you go into scenario planning mode as opposed to what they call a market feasibility, we come up with a very different perspective on real estate. Once you've built a scenario, you can then apply shocks to that scenario, and that gives you much better predictability. So I will try now and turn to Malaysia, where we actually did some work for a major international bank with a loan book of about 10 billion. Um, and we said, all right, let's look at the market, and let's look at the shocks that are going to come. So the HSR was intended to create a corridor to Singapore, which we all know about. And it has been linked to the MRT, which was part of an overall city plan. And as you can see, the HSR is linked via the Tun Raja Exchange uh, through a project called Banda Malaysia. And I know that some of the people who are here today from Lend Lease, who were here yesterday, uh, are involved in that development. Um, and it's interesting to note that Kwasa Land, which is part of the Employees Provident Fund, ha is building a 1,600-acre new township, knowing that this was going to be the MRT that was coming, and how were they going to anchor one end of it. So we are actually seeing three anchors, one being the, the, the developed by Kwasa Land in, in, in Sungai Bulo, the next being the HSR linked to Singapore, and the final one being the Kajang Depot. So what you're doing is you're creating like a, a, a dumbbell with a center part that connects into Singapore. What we did was we said, all right, let's look at the demand and supply, which, uh, which one does normally, and let, but let's look at the demand drivers, the demographics, the, the primary and secondary markets, how do government regulations come into this, the investor behavior, what infrastructure is coming in, what are the regional and sub-sector specific drivers. And then we looked at the supply, types of supply, the pipelines, and then we compared that to the commentary of local developers as well as local participants in, in the real estate industry. And that ended up with us actually studying 256 sub-sectors in KL, Penang, and Johor. And what we came up with was, was what we call a heat map. Um, the green parts are positive, i.e. opportunities for real estate, and the red are where it looks very risky. 
and the yellow are the uncertain areas. If you look at the, uh, I will go into the, 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 the elements that have, I've got in green um, so that you can get a sense of how we then analyzed. And then we said, what was the finding? The first finding we had was that residential opportunities were driven more by population growth and lifestyle than just purely infrastructure. The second thing we found was that the risks were actually caused by oversupply, infrastructure, and very often poorly thought out value propositions. So for example, in Kuala Lumpur, if you look at the red outlined area, the mass market is fine because there is an underlying demand, just like you have in Jakarta. With Me Me Meikata, you actually have an underlying demand from urban professionals, people who cannot afford the high end. But there's huge overbuilding at the high end. So it's, it's, it, by, the, by, by the time 2020 comes around, we see that um, you know, the high end market in, in Kuala Lumpur is going to be very, very badly oversupplied. Um, like similarly in Johor, it's crazy now, it's, it's going to be crazy in five years time as well. 30,000 units are going to be built, supposedly if they all get built, uh, and the demand is 2,200 units a year. So who's going to take up the rest? We then applied the shock of the high-speed rail to this model to see what it would lo look like in 2024. And what we found were that four, four or five opportunities came up, and those are the ones I've outlined in green. In the high-end market, actually, it turns from red to green, because if that high-speed rail comes in, we see the opportunity of, of Kuala Lumpur becoming a suburb of Singapore. You're 90 minutes away, so you could actually relocate your offices in a cheaper location. You could even live in KL, and you could commute every day to work. Um, likewise, for offices and residential in Selangor, you've got the land bridge and the high-speed rail creating a big demand for industrial and warehousing and offices. And in lock-up shops in Johor, to service the ports and the oil, you're going to see a lot more demand. So that is actually the basis of how we did a heat map for Kuala Lumpur and its surrounds. But what was very interesting was when you look at the way the government policy has been working, if Bandar Malaysia does get built, you're going to see a four times increase in office space. It's going to destroy the office market. So how is that going to work out? Likewise, the other thing that's happening is that offices are moving out of Kuala Lumpur. Today, you have a 77% occupancy in offices in Kuala Lumpur. But everybody is trying to move out to the suburbs because they can't get any labor in KL. Right? So everybody's relocating. Shah Alam, Kapong, elsewhere. And so the consequence is that we need to sort of look at this in a much more detailed way. That, that's really my message to you, rather than giving you a lecture on Malaysia. Now let's look at Indonesia. Very different story. This is a picture of uh, Jokowi doing the groundbreaking for the, for the One Belt, One Road initiative, Jakarta Bandung Rail. Now what was very interesting here um, coming back to Tom's point, is that the original high-speed rail was meant to go from Jakarta straight down to Bandung, which you see by the red line. In fact, what's happened is that they're going to upgrade to a medium-speed rail using existing lanes. Now, what this does, of course, which is I mean, so obvious to all of us in real estate, is that the nodal points have create development opportunities. But I've actually focused on one development opportunity, which is Meikata, which is a Lippo land development. Um, and I think we have somebody here who is involved with Lippo. Um, 
And I think what is very important to note here, why was the rail line changed from high speed to medium speed? Was it really only just because it was too expensive? Or was it because Lippo did a joint venture with the Chinese? Was it also because Lippo already had the land through which a medium speed rail would run through? Or was it because um, it was more convenient? I don't know the answer to that, uh, but I think those of us who are in Indonesia will probably be able to tell me what the real story is. So the medium speed rail runs through own land owned by Lippo on a 2,200 hectare site, they're building a new city. They're proposing to build 100 residential towers now. And I heard yesterday that three of the towers are totally sold out. Now, of course, the issue is that the city ombudsman has raised the, the fact that the land is uh, illegally sold. But nobody believes that that won't be sorted out because typically, as in an Indonesian solution, with Wijakarya as the partner of Lipo, which is government-owned, in a share-share basis, this problem will get resolved. Now, the Chinese have also invested in a number of areas, particularly Greenland, but whether or not they are able to overcome these issues, uh, I think will take time, and that's one of the reasons for the delays. So, these, so in an environment like Indonesia, which is much more opaque in terms of government and land laws, actually it benefits the locals versus the Chinese. Let's look at Vietnam. I, I won't spend too much time on this except to say that I think what's interesting is that Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh are already seeing growth, massive growth. And Hanoi's rail projects are, are slated to cost 31 billion. And because Ho Chi Minh has actually opted for the Japanese and European players, China has actually pledged 11 billion of its own money, not borrowed money by in Vietnam, to build those rail lines in, 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 in Hanoi. So what I'm saying is negotiating power is based very much on how governments play with the Chinese. Um, and of course, in terms of opportunities, I think it's very obvious. Improved connectivity creates decentralized commercial supply. And I think one of the interesting things to note in, in, in Vietnam particularly, because of the diff differences in land laws, there are a lot of tells, condo tells, you know, office tells, and these are temporary supply type pro of property creating a whole new class of real estate. And also the creation of, of specialized districts, for example, District 2 in Ho Chi Minh is likely to end up being an education and a high-tech hub. This is another very important aspect, I think, in terms of opportunity for real estate. Last year, 135 million Chinese went abroad. And in the world today, one out of every five tourist dollars that are spent are Chinese dollars. This is just unheard of, unseen in the world in this five-year period. And, but what is very important, I think, to understand is that consumer tastes of the Chinese who travel abroad has changed. In the past, it was all about branded goods, but today you can buy it all in China. So now it's about experiences. And I think this has tremendous implications for real estate developers who up till now are actually very bad at building experiential real estate. It's all about buy, sell, get out. Um, and I think they're gonna have to start changing because the Chinese can do it faster, better, cheaper. And I think there's another aspect to the Chinese tourist. Something that people don't realize is that today the three largest e-commerce sites in the world are Chinese. Now, that has tremendous implications for tourism and tremendous implications for retail in Southeast Asia. I think if you walk around Singapore today, you'll see that half the malls are struggling to survive. And one of the reasons that they do survive is because you've got monopolistic landlords who say, you don't fill up my mall, I won't give you the other malls. But that's a game that doesn't last. 
This is the new game. When Chinese tourists are coming in, this is a platform, by the way, which Singapore has already adopted. They're connecting the direct service providers through the various platforms that Baidu has. Baidu has 70 million users on this particular tourism platform, which through C-Trip organizes people's trips. And I, I think you may have noticed that over 70% of Chinese tourists use a mobile app to book their foreign trips. So what you're going to be seeing more and more is partnerships which are going to be controlled through Chinese platforms. And this is going to change the basis of what you're going to build. I think one of the trends is healthcare. You're going to see a huge outflow of healthcare needs. Already in Southeast Asia, there is a shortage of health facilities. I think you're going to see huge demand from China. I think the retiree options within Southeast Asia are going to drive. And the digital services that are being input by the Chinese are going to be great enablers. So that's one area I see of opportunity. In fact, I am quite involved in this particular sector, advising a number of healthcare uh, companies. Um, I think creating destinations, as I talked about, the experiential. So I think the new tourists are looking for other kinds of real estate, and it's experientially based. Because a lot of the stuff, actually, through e-commerce can be accessed. So you're going to see many more boutique opportunities. And the other area that Chinese tourists are using, I'm sorry, I'm running out a little bit ov over time. Please stop me if I'm, if I'm talking too much. Um, airport retail is going to be another factor because the way Chinese are buying um, goods is actually when they go home. So I foresee that there will be tremendous growth in airport retail. And you can already see that in Guangzhou, you can see that in Shanghai, huge airport on, on emporiums. And finally, I see education and residential as twin drivers. And Singapore has already seen that. I don't know, those of you who are from Singapore will remember the word study mama, where you bring your children to Singapore and you come as the mama that looks after them and quite often even have a temporary husband until your child graduates and you go back home to your real husband. So some conclusions. In the short term, the one belt, one road is I don't think going to change things very much except to raise land prices around the locations that have been identified. You've already seen that in Myanmar, although local real estate players are not allowed to participate in that initiative, what's happening is that people are selling their land and dumping it back into other properties, building hotels, building commercial areas in other places. So there's a recycling going on. Um, and of course, development at nodal points. I've already mentioned that service-based opportunities are already there. Um, in the long term, of course, the whole urban landscape will change. I think um, Tom talked about the two bridges in Laos. Uh, Vientiane has already become a hot spot. Um, and the others I, I won't get into, but I think what's salutary is the Chinese demand for luxury housing in Bangkok, Singapore, and Manila. I was talking to um, the Sun Street people who are here uh, at this place, and I think next year's projection is 140 million US dollars worth of sales purely to Chinese buyers. And so you're seeing the, 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 um, the, 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 the flooding of high-end residential markets, Singapore too, Johor and Jakarta. And you're also seeing huge investments into rental opportunities, and Singapore's already seen the entry of um, Chinese developers actually buying even on-block sales, which is a very specialized world. Um, and you're seeing huge market distortions in, in Johor, for example. And I suspect you'll see it in, in, in Jakarta. Um, I suspect you'll see it in other places. Um, and already you're seeing, uh, you know, issues of the clawback from China having tremendous uh, projects that are not completed. Um, one of the big Chinese developers that I was advising last year 
uh, you know, 16 billion ringgit investment has just stopped work 100% um, once the clawback regulations came in. So my conclusion for, from an overall perspective is to benefit from OBOR, really countries need to have a policy angle uh, in order for local real estate developers to benefit. And I think a lot of effort needs to be put in by local developers to work with the government. And there are risks that you get copies of this, so, so you know, there's no need to, for me to run through every single one of these. But the only point that I will actually raise is the question of debt sustainability. Laos, of course, is one great example on opportunity uh, where this might be a problem. So, in conclusion, I would say the sheer asymmetry of China's power and prowess automatically puts other players at a huge disadvantage. And to benefit from OBO, we cannot be blind to the complex factors influencing demand and supply drivers for real estate. Thank you. Thank you, Rafiq. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, you mentioned how in the Vietnamese case they managed to reach a more advantageous um, arrangement with the Chinese rather than simple debt financing. And I just wondered if you had any view on what distinguished the Vietnamese government or the Vietnamese bureaucracy in being able to reach that arrangement compared to some other peer countries. Well, I think there's two perspectives. There's a, there's a historical problem between Vietnam and China that's always been there. So they've always been very suspicious of Chinese overtures. Uh, and I think the riots in Vietnam over Chinese factories really woke the government up. So I think that what has been interesting for, 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 for me to look at from the outside is that the Vietnamese have a very clear vision of their own destiny. And they've understood that you need to balance China. Um, and that's why what they've done, I think, is to say, all right, Ho Chi Minh, go your own way. We are next door to China. We can't really fight. So we'll play the game with the Chinese. But I think the, at the core of it, I think is a very clear understanding of how Vietnam sees itself. And I would say the same applies to Thailand, which is why in Thailand you do not have, the, the rail is going to be built using Chinese technology, but the Thais said, look, we don't want your money and we don't want you to, bu uh, to build it for us. Any other questions? The Chinese towards Singapore. The question was, how do I see China uh, and its reading, uh, your, uh, my reading of how it looks at Singapore? I think Singapore really needs to rethink its role. Up till now, I think Singapore has, I, I, so I'm taking your question from the opposite. I think up till now, Singapore has always said, oh, we will interpret the world for you, China, because we are exposed, we are integrated, we understand the world. The Chinese are now saying, listen, small boy, we don't need to talk to you anymore. We have our own connections and we hold the power. So I think Singapore really needs to redefine. Um, I think one of the things that's not understood is that the, the rail link between Kuantan and Port Klang Port, 80% of China's oil goes past Singapore, right? The saving in time between using Kuantan versus Singapore's port is 34 hours. Not worth talking about. The cost is $5 more per ton using Malaysia rather than Singapore. So why are they building it? Basically, it's saying that if we need to cut you off, we will. And Malaysia is actually going to finance it for us. So I think Singapore really needs to see its new role and what is it that it is going to play? Is it going to be just a, a money laundry center for Chinese money? Is it going to be playing the, I, I mean, I don't agree with Tom in terms of the uh, commercialization of Chinese currency. 
I think it's going to be much faster, but I see it actually happening via Singapore. Great. We still have uh, time for one question. Anyone? I, I do have one. <laughs> Rafiq, you know, it's, it's great presentation. Thank you, by the Thank way. Uh, I want to, you know, I, I'm just wondering, um, as this train, the high-speed rail uh, gets constructed, and a lot of the infrastructure, let's say Bangkok, you know, I mean, they're, they're already in place. How are they going to be working around a lot of this, you know, like Jakarta has a lot of things in place, and if you're going to be, you know, building all of this, mm -hmm. that would really disrupt a lot of things over there in many of these places. Obviously, it's not the same like with Cambodia, right, or Myanmar, right, where they're... It's, it's very green. Correct, yeah. yeah. But how about for the cities that have already a lot of the infrastructure in place, and we're already seeing a lot of them, Manila for one, it's bursting at the seams, right? right? Traffic congestion. So how, how are... I'm just wondering, how are they going to be working around those? Uh, well, I think what's very interesting to see, um, uh, I mean, I don't have an answer, but I think what's interesting to see is what Kuala Lumpur is doing and what Jakarta is doing. They first focused on their MRT systems in order to try and pave the way for the rest of the infrastructure that needs to come in. Because once that MRT system comes up, you're already starting to disperse the growing urbanization. Um, Malaysia, of course, being a more developed environment, has been faster at implementing that. But Jakarta is, I mean, if you, if you go into central Jakarta today, it's already happening. That's it. All right, Great. thank you very much. Thank you. Uh,